It's her. Playing tennis with someone might reveal a lot about them. Guys that are gentlemen on the tennis court are typically also gentlemen off the court, in my experience. On the other hand, I witnessed a person playing his best friend exhibit the worst sportsmanship I had ever seen. Later on, when the gentleman ran off with another man's wife and abandoned his family, it didn't surprise me at all. Frank, who was a football player at Georgia until he blew up his knee, is another large guy. Frank turned to tennis when the surgeon fixed it. However, he approaches the game of tennis like a football player, smashing powerful serves and attacking the opponent from the baseline. However, I can defeat him. I prefer to approach the net and provide pressure to him so that he hits it past me. He'll almost always overhit and send the ball bouncing off the back fence. And let's not even talk about his phone calls. Let's just say that when he's making the decision, he always gets the benefit of the doubt. Frank always wants to play me as a result. He simply cannot tolerate losing to a little guy. However, I am not small at all, I stand six feet tall. However, compared to Frank, who is three inches taller and 75 pounds heavier than me, I'm fairly thin and wiry. It should come as no surprise that I don't particularly enjoy playing with Frank, but living in the Eden Point subdivision north of Atlanta makes it difficult to ignore him. Our subdivision was constructed around a clubhouse featuring numerous tennis courts and a swimming pool, as Atlanta is a major tennis hub. It's difficult to ignore Frank because there are so many players on teams in the tennis association competition. The good news is that I get to play with a lot of lovely people, like Penny Pennington, who is my mixed doubles partner. Through my wife, Melanie, I got to know Penny. Penny is one of the many Eden Point residents who attend lessons at Melanie's studio, where she teaches pillates. Melanie, sadly, is not a big tennis player. However, she introduced me to Penny when she found out that she was seeking for a partner, and we have been playing together for about a year now. I had volunteered to drive Penny in order to save gas because the club we were playing against today was all the way out in Stone Mountain. We allowed ourselves 45 minutes to get there, given how traffic tends to build up on a Saturday afternoon. Penny came out of her front door, and I pondered again why she was still unmarried. She had lost her husband in a car accident three years prior, which played a part in it. After a protracted period of mourning, she attended Melanie's Pilates class as a coping mechanism for her loss. Resuming her tennis game, which she had played in high school, was an additional option. After all that exercise, she was a trim, dark-haired, fit woman in her early 30s. A woman as attractive as Penny should attract suitors like flies to honey, or so I would have thought. She simply hadn't found the right man, though, as she continued to tell Melanie. When Penny opened the door of my car, I said, Hey, Penny, are you ready to get him today? She smiled at me. You bet, Michael. I've been looking forward to a rematch with these guys for a long time. I became distracted from our conversation regarding our match strategy as I pulled onto I-285 by my phone ringing. Hi, Robert. You're kidding. No, it's perfect here. Damn. Okay, we'll reschedule. As I took the next exit and started to drive back home, Penny gave me a puzzled look. I informed her that was our opponent. The city of Atlanta is infamous for its isolated storms, which can submerge a single section of the city while the sun is shining brightly only a few miles away. He told me that a rainstorm just passed through and the courts are unplayable. It was obvious that Penny was dissatisfied. Darn it, I was really looking forward to playing today. Listen, I replied, why don't we go back to the club? We can get in some practice, and maybe there'll be somebody there willing to play. I turned onto the road leading home as soon as I drew into Eden Point's main entrance. I just want to stop and pick up my check for this quarter's club dues, I said to Penny. I won't be but a minute. After pulling up to the curb, I hurried to the front door. I knew exactly where to find the check because I'd written it out and left it on my dresser last night. However, I shouldn't have noticed the noises coming from the master bedroom as I was walking down the hall. Oh, please, continue doing that. Yes, exactly like that. What the devil was it? Melanie's voice. Melanie was on the bed with a man as I tiptoed down the hall and peered in the door. My initial reaction was to storm into the room and assault him, but what good would that do? I stumbled back from the door as though I'd been hit by a punch. It was simply too much to handle. They've already cheated on me, fighting him won't change that, I asked myself in a dejected manner. Furthermore, he is so much bigger than me that he could still beat me to a pulp even if I land the initial strike. However, I don't want him to escape with it. I thought to myself, oh, hell, I've got to get her home first, then I can come back here to face them, as I stood there and suddenly remembered Penny sitting in the car. Feeling as though I may throw up at any moment, I found myself dazedly making my way back down the hall and out the front door. A little later, I climbed into the driver's seat and turned on the engine. It can't have been good, I don't know what I looked like. Are you okay, Michael? Penny asked, her eyes wide with worry as she stared at me. I'm sorry, Penny, but I'm not going to be able to hit with you today, I said, putting the car in park as soon as I arrived at Penny's house, clutching the steering wheel as hard as I could. What's occurred, Michael, what is it? With mounting anxiety, she inquired. I turned to face her as she went over to switch off the engine when I didn't answer, taking the keys with her as she got out and approached my door. Please return the keys to me. No, she strongly objected, not until you tell me what happened. 
You're not going anywhere until you come inside and tell me what's going on, she said, pulling on my arm as she opened the car door. Tell me, Michael, she said, taking my hand and pressing mine into hers as I got out of the car and followed her into her house. She vanished for a while before reappearing with a glass of cold water, which I sipped on instinctively while she watched. What took place inside? I tried to talk, but my throat immediately seized up again, so I took another sip of water. Immediately, all my resistance gave way and I slumped back into the back of the sofa. It was Melanie and Frank, I muttered. She gave me a disbelieving look and replied, go on. They were in our bedroom together. She let out a gasp. No, that can't be right. Melanie would never do that. I felt a tear streak down my face as the picture of the two of them returned to me. I croaked. I never thought she would either, as the ache in my throat got worse. Could it have been something else, Michael? Could you have been mistaken? She inquired. Even though I understood she was attempting to assist, my rage still continued to grow. She was lying on her back with Frank when I peered inside. My irate sarcasm made her wince. I'm so sorry, Michael. I simply hoped there may be another answer, not because I was doubting you. I was struck with even more pain, and with Frank Calhoun of all people. I growled, how could she have allowed that large baboon to get close to her? I guess that explains why Frank started taking Melanie's Pilates class, Penny thought. He was enrolled in her course. She never told me that, I screamed. I answered angrily, thanks a lot for warning me, but my fury was still running high. Penny was now in pain. Michael, that's not fair. I was unaware that there was a romantic relationship between the two of them. I apologized to Penny, saying that I didn't mean to lash out at her. Simply put, I'm not feeling well at the moment. I felt her hand tighten. Don't worry, Michael. I can only image your current state of mind. I got up and said to her, I have to go back there and see what's really going on. Michael, you're not going to do something violent. No, I just need to get some answers. She gripped my hand and said, Michael, please let me know what transpires. And do let me know if I may be of any assistance. I thanked her and drove home, knowing full well that there would be more questions to ask and that I would probably be met with tears and denial and angry words, and I would have to figure out how to handle them and what to do about Frank if he was still alive. I could feel the adrenaline coursing through me. Melanie, dressed in her robe with her hair wrapped in a towel, must have heard me enter through the kitchen door because she came out to greet me. You're back early, she remarked with a smile. How was the match? We were rained out, I murmured in a hushed tone. Oh, I'm sorry you didn't get to play, she responded. I'll bet Penny was disappointed. I avoided small talk and simply stared at her. I mutely remarked, they called about the rain right after we left. She blinked, but her look remained unchanged. My heartbeat quickened as I told her, I came back to the house and saw you and Frank together. Melanie's remark, I'm sorry you had to see that, was not what I had expected to happen, out of all the scenarios I had imagined. All you have to say is that, you're cheating on me and you're sorry I saw it. I questioned, skeptically, will you not even apologize for having slept with him? What is the duration of this situation? Have you not had an explanation of any kind? Sit down, Michael, she urged, indicating the breakfast room table, with crossed arms and a sigh. I'd rather stand, I replied angrily. She responded, suit yourself, and sat down, leaving me stunned by her complete lack of response. Listen, Michael, this simply pushes the timeline a little bit, but we were going to inform you shortly anyhow. I am going to leave you. I'm moving in with Frank since we are in love. As soon as the divorce is finalized, we will tie the knot. I sat down because I didn't want a chance falling. She sprang up and yelled, wait here, before she disappeared back toward our bedroom. She returned a little while later, clutching a sheaf of papers, and slid them across the table at me before I could think of anything to say. She said, I don't even want any alimony from you. This doesn't have to be acrimonious. Since I'm leaving you the house, it's only fair that I take all the money out of our savings account. Though I'm fine with that if you'll sign the paperwork and allow us all to move on with our lives, this is a far better bargain than you'll receive if we go to court. I opened the bundle of documents and saw that it was a divorce petition. You've seen a lawyer already. Surprised, I questioned, what about our marriage? How did the past 10 years of our relationship go? I apologize, Michael. This just happened, it wasn't something I planned. Simply accept it for what it is. Acknowledge it. Acknowledge that my devoted wife is sharing our bed with that Frank. I yelled. Recognize that our marriage has ended abruptly. She got up and said, Michael, I'm disappointed. I was hoping you would respond with more maturity. She turned around and made her way back to the bedroom. Talk about cognitive dissonance. If someone had asked me that morning, I would have said that I loved my wife and that our marriage was going well. But this afternoon I find out that she is leaving me for another man. I sat there at the table, staring at the divorce petition in front of me and trying to make sense of what was happening. A telephone beeping could be heard in the silence, followed by brief exchanges of speech. Now that you've forced the issue, I don't intend to stay here tonight, she said, clutching an overnight bag and makeup kit when she emerged. Frank is on his way to pick me up. We'll return on Monday while you're at work to pick up the remainder of my belongings. You're leaving like that, then. She declared, it has to be that way. All right, I replied sourly. 
What should I tell our friends? She groaned, listen, Frank, Michael, and I don't want to run away like criminals. We haven't done anything illegal. We will not stop participating in social activities. Actually, tomorrow night we're probably going to the Eden Point reception. Everyone will already be aware of it, therefore there won't be any need for you to notify them. Melanie peered out the window and said, Frank's here. I'm going now. Suddenly, there was the beep of a horn outside. Just sign the papers, Michael, she said, leaning back to face me as she closed the door. It will be better for all of us if you act sooner, she said, and then she was gone. I don't know how long I sat there, but feelings raced through me like trains speeding through a crosswalk. I would be boiling with rage one minute, and then filled with sadness remembering better times. I told myself I'd treated her like a queen, then I wondered what I'd done to make her leave. I'm better off without her, I kept saying, until loneliness overcame me. How are you doing, Michael? I was a little surprised to hear Penny's voice when I answered my phone. I think I was hoping to hear Melanie's voice. May I ask? She inquired. I answered, not so good. She left me. It's heard, she replied. Have you heard? I exclaimed, shocked. Where? How? I'm sorry, Michael, she grumbled. Frank's been up at the clubhouse boasting about it. It's already started, I thought to myself, oh, hell. I was not going to travel up there, so on Sunday I called our men's team captain. I'm sorry, Joe, I told him, you're going to have to scratch me from the lineup today. I need to take care of some personal matters. Yeah, I heard, he apologized in a kind way. Man, good luck. I thanked him, but I knew I would only be getting worse luck from now on. I was hiding, I suppose, though it hurt to admit it. I didn't pay much attention to the sports on TV, and all I could think about was my marriage to Melanie and where it had all gone wrong. When did she stop loving me? She'd majored in health and physical education, and every time my fraternity brother saw her in workout clothes, they would pick on me. We'd gone steady throughout our senior year, I'd asked her to marry me over Christmas break, and I felt certain that she'd loved me when we got married right out of college. After a few years, we'd saved enough money for a down payment on a house, and we found exactly what we were looking for in a brand new development named Eden Point. We had an easy marriage, with me landing a terrific job in Atlanta and her finding work as an aerobics class instructor. We'd been happy here at Eden Point, I thought, with me getting several promotions with my company and Melanie going out on my own. By then we had saved up enough money to rent a studio space in one of the local strip malls, and her business took off. We had a thriving savings account, lots of friends and acquaintances, especially at Eden Point, and we had even begun discussing the possibility of starting a family in the next year or two. Though our bedroom lives had slowed down a little, that hadn't surprised me either. My job kept me busy, and teaching pillates full-time wears anyone out. And when I went back and reviewed, I realized that, although I hadn't noticed it at the time, things had really slowed down in the last six months. I also remembered that Melanie had occasionally seemed a little distracted, as if she were in another world, but that our bedroom lives had remained as healthy as ever when we made love, and I had assumed Melanie felt the same. Clearly, I was mistaken. I mentally kicked myself, wondering how I could have been so blind to see that she was seeing someone else, or that she was falling for Frank Calhoun instead of me. All I could figure out was that when you love and trust someone, you don't look for signs of betrayal and deceit. No, I thought sarcastically, you just have to wait until they dope slap you in the back of the head. Monday, I arrived at work early in an attempt to get ahead of the game. At approximately 9 o'clock, I called my attorney's office to try to schedule an appointment. When the secretary inquired as to the reason for the meeting, I explained that I needed to make some changes to my will in order to avoid getting into the Melanie and me situation. When she returned to the call, she informed me that he could see me immediately following lunch. Jonathan met me in the lobby of his legal office, we had been classmates in our college days, and I had gone to him when Melanie and I decided to draft wills. When we took a seat in his office, he gave me a worried look and said, Is everything okay, Michael? I recognize that you must amend your will. Neither Melanie nor you are sick, are you? I appreciate your concern, Jonathan, but it's not as bad as you think, I said, passing him the documents Melanie had given me on Saturday. Michael, I am so sad to hear this. Do you believe that a reconciliation is possible? I don't believe so. She moved in with her partner and left our house already. She informed me that as soon as our divorce is finalized, they intend to tie the knot. I would never have expected this, he shook his head. It appeared like the ideal pair, you two. With a professional tone in his voice, he said, given those circumstances, as your legal advisor, my advice to you is to sign this agreement immediately. His demeanor altered. So, ten years of marriage erased in an instant. I uttered those words with bitterness. In situations like this, Michael, you have to stop thinking with your heart and start thinking with your head, he said, gently shaking his head. According to how I see it, Melanie has extended you a really kind offer that is far superior to what you would receive if you choose to quarrel about it. She might be partially motivated by guilt, but I'm willing to wager that her major goal is to pressure you into agreeing as soon as possible so she can wed her new partner. This is the finest deal you can hope for if your marriage is finished, even though it may feel like you're giving in to her now. It felt like she and Frank had beaten me in a game I didn't even realize I was playing, but I knew he was right. 
Hell, after what she'd done, I didn't want to stay married to her anyhow. Jonathan's voice again took on a compassionate tone, saying, Listen, Michael, I know the lawyer Melanie used. We can expeditiously file this settlement agreement with the court if you sign. That will essentially guarantee what she has suggested. Then, you still have 30 days to end the divorce if she starts to experience buyer's remorse and wants to return, and if you're willing to accept her back. I was certain it was not going to occur. May I use your pen? I inquired. I guess I won't have to make an announcement in the office now, I thought wryly as I headed straight to human resources after returning to work. I had a ton of changes to make regarding my health insurance, my 401 Kelvin plan, and numerous other benefits that involve the spouse. The clerk who assisted me must have done this a lot because he was able to produce all the forms I needed in short order. As I was signing them, I glanced up to see him staring at me. That evening, I made a stop at a nearby restaurant to grab takeout for dinner, but when I got home, I discovered that Melanie had spent the entire day packing everything she desired. Naturally, all of her makeup had vanished, but what surprised me was the amount of clothes she had left behind, which, upon closer inspection, turned out to be items she no longer wore. I guess I get to haul them off to Goodwill, I moaned. After more research, I discovered that she had not only raided the bedroom, our fine china and most of the serving pieces we had received as wedding presents were gone. From the kitchen, I noticed that several utensils and our good carving knives had also been carted off. Several pieces of furniture were missing. I also noticed that large chunks of our CD and DVD collections had disappeared, and as I rummaged through our possession, I discovered that she had left our wedding album untouched, which for some reason saddened me more than anything else she had taken. I returned to the kitchen and put the groceries I had purchased in the fridge. I was so hungry after learning of her intrusion. I mentally noted that I needed the locks replaced. Damn it to hell, how do you go from being happily married to a single lonely divorced man in three days? I thought to myself, everything appeared incredibly unjust. For the next week, I worked from early in the morning until late at night, living in virtual solitude. If not, I remained inside the house. It was nearly intolerable how humiliating it was to have Frank Calhoun take my wife, and there was nothing I could do about it. I'll confess that I occasionally daydreamed about paid pros and entertained thoughts about attacks with a baseball bat or brass knuckles, but I would return to reality thereafter. Was it really worth ruining my life to exact revenge on a slime ball who chased skirts and a woman who couldn't keep her legs together? I made the decision to emerge from my cocoon on Friday. Since I had done nothing illegal, I had nothing to conceal. I gave Penny a call, striking a cheerful tone. I said, hey, partner, don't we have a tennis match scheduled for this weekend? She spoke hastily, Oh, Michael, I'm so glad to hear from you. I thought about calling you so many times, but I thought maybe you'd prefer to be alone for a while. Thanks, Penny, I said, lowering my voice. It's been a rough week. I told her everything that had transpired and then inquired as to what else was going on at Eden Point that I had been unaware. After hesitating for a short while, she finally conceded that our circumstance was the talk of the subdivision. I remarked harshly, you'd think they could find something better to discuss. They might, Penny said, but Frank and Melanie don't make it easy. They've been socializing at the clubhouse every night since last Saturday. Frank is all but openly bragging about how the better man won, and Melanie hangs on him like an infatuated schoolgirl. Her voice carried fury, which I could hear. It's just sickening, Michael. I quit her pillates course straight away and told her I couldn't be her friend anymore, she stated. Her devotion cheered me on a bit. What about the others, Penny? What are they saying? I responded. I guess it's what you'd expect, Michael. There are some who are pretty unhappy with Frank and Melanie, and they try to avoid the lovebirds as much as possible. Then there's the group that always hang around Frank. They're all lauding his prowess, if you know what I mean. But for the majority of people it's just a sad, awkward situation, and they try to stay out of it as much as they can. Though rationally I'd known that would be the case, a part of me had hoped that Frank and Melanie would be tarnished and driven out of town by train. But I wasn't going to allow my disappointment get in the way of me. Be that as it may, I'm not going to spend the rest of my life in hiding, I said to Penny. We're scheduled to play on Saturday, and unless you'd rather not. I intend to get out on the court with my partner, I informed her. She embraced me and said, I'm glad, Michael, you can count on me. I purposefully left early to go to the tennis courts in order to avoid talking to people about things I didn't want to talk about. It didn't really help because I could feel my neighbors and teammates' eyes on me as I approached the tennis pavilion. Though I could appreciate their curiosity, I detested the sensation still. Michael, I'm so sorry. The other team made a last-second change in their lineup, and some of the matches have already started, so I can't change it. If you don't want to play, I'll understand. Our mixed doubles team captain hurried over to me as soon as she spotted me. What are you talking about, Mary? I said, I don't understand. It's Frank, she declared. You and Penny are scheduled to play Frank and his partner. Oh, SHT, was my thought. That's the last thing I wanted. Penny suddenly stood up, and her face turned pale as she realized what was going on. We don't have to do this, Michael. It's no big deal, we'll just forfeit and play somebody else next week. She said as she took me aside. I exclaimed, no. 
loudly enough to make Penny startle. I am not going to hide from that bastard the rest of my life. I'm going to have to face him, and it might as well start now. I looked back to Mary, but Penny gave me a troubled look. No worries, I assured her. Penny and I are here to play. It was a massacre. I played worse than I had for years, and Penny could see that I was obviously upset. On the other hand, Frank was definitely in his element. His massive, powerful ground strokes flying over the net like bullets from an RPG to exacerbate matters. He was continuously making fun of me during the game. I floated a weak shot, and he slammed it for a victory. Come on, Michael, you can hit it harder than that, he cried. I just got mad the second time he said something like, your wife can hit it harder than that. Oh, wait, my bad, you don't have a wife. Our little bout had drawn a crowd, which made matters worse, and when I looked up, I saw Melanie standing by the fence. He feigned to tie his shoelace while I looked at him with a venomous look in my eyes. At last, I turned and walked back to where I had been. The result was a dismal loss. I walked to the net to shake hands with our opponents while gritting my teeth. When she shook my hand, Frank's partner appeared embarrassed by his behavior and mumbled an apology to me. Frank, on the other hand, turned pointedly, strolled over to Melanie, and planted a big kiss over the waist-high fence, all without having to offer his hand. That was a lot of fun. Let's do it again the next time you feel like taking a beating. Whatever Penny saw in my expression, I don't know, but she grabbed my arm and dragged me off the court. He's trying to provoke you, Michael. He'd love for you to start a fight with him. Don't let him get to you. Please, for my sake. After I took a seat on the bleachers, I was given a cup of ice water by someone. After taking a few swallows, I threw the rest onto my head. It was impossible for me to feel worse than I did that afternoon. I told Penny I was sorry for playing so bad, and even though she objected, I got in my car and drove home. I threw my clothing in the hamper, hauled myself into the shower, and spent 30 minutes letting the water fall off of me. I was eventually disgusted and furious when the water went cold enough for me to get out and dry off before collapsing onto the bed. I realized why I hadn't won, I'd given in to Frank, knowing that simply made my feelings worse. Though obviously in a different way, he managed to get through to both Melanie and me. Still, the result was the same, to make Frank, a loser, the great winner. I made a self-promise to myself that I would not tolerate any more abuse from Frank or Melanie. I was going to figure out a method to get the better of them both. All I had to do now was figure out how to do that. I reclined on the bed and considered the advice I had received from my former tennis coach, play to your opponent's weakness. That was sensible in theory, but how could I put it into practice in this particular circumstance? I am aware of who I am. My brain will continue to attack a problem even if my conscious mind shifts to other duties once I start working on it. In fact, I've discovered that when I revisit a problem after putting it off for a long, the answer is usually obvious. And in this instance, that is what took place. After considering the task for a bit, I decided to put it aside and spend the most of Sunday finishing up the yard work I had neglected. I was so exhausted by that evening that I had little trouble dozing off. I knew I had a potential fix when I reported to work the following day. If it works, it'll be worth it, I told myself, despite the fact that it would surely be costly. Midway through the morning, I called one of our top sales representatives. When I finally got to Jerry, I asked, Hey, Jerry, would you mind having lunch with me today? It's my treat. Sure, Michael, especially if you're buying. We got together at a somewhat dilapidated looking bar and grill, but the food is excellent. Jerry turned to face me after we had placed our order. Hey, Michael, I was real sorry to hear about you and Melanie. I thought you guys had everything going for you. Jerry said, Yeah, me too, Jerry, me too. But actually, that's sort of why I wanted to talk to you. Sure, Michael, I'd be glad to help any way I can. Okay, Jerry, so here's my question. When you're entertaining your best clients, have you ever had occasion to use an escort service? He gave me a strange look. No, Michael, absolutely not. That's against company policy, and I would never do that. I leaned in his direction across the table. Jerry, this is not a company issue, and we're not on business here. This is strictly personal, if you know what I mean. After a few moments of staring at me, light appeared in his eyes. Oh, I see, he replied. I guess it's been a long dry spell for you, what with the wife splitting and you being out of the dating game and all. He stopped and then got closer to me. Sure, I know one of the top services in the city. But listen, Michael, they cater only to the biggest hitters, understand. Their girls are unbelievable, but I think they may be way out of your price range. I gave him a smile. You let me worry about that. Just tell me how to get in touch with them and what to expect. And that is just what he did over burgers and beer. That afternoon, as I reviewed the notes I'd taken at lunch, I felt anxious. I hoped that what I was doing was correct. Then I thought of Melanie's chilly-eyed departure announcement and Frank's teasing of me, and I made the decision to go for it. When I dialed the number Jerry had me, a friendly man's voice answered. Hello, may I help you? Yes, please let me talk with Mr. Henry Miller, I replied as I was told to. This is Mr. Miller, answered the speaker. What are you looking for? Something from the Grove Press, was my reply. Please give me your name, sir. I considered going undercover, but Jerry had been very clear that I had to stay true to who I was. 
They're always worried about the vice squad, he stated to me. They'll go to great lengths to make sure you're not a cop trying to set them up. I introduced myself to him. Mr. Miller inquired, are you calling from your office? Yes, I responded, but this is a personal matter. It has nothing to do with my company. I quite understand, sir. Now would you give me the switchboard number where you work? Sure, I replied, but wouldn't you rather have my direct line instead? No, he answered. I'll ask for you over on the main line when we can handle your business. That's pretty smart, I thought to myself. He knows he's calling a legitimate business and not the police department if he calls and the operator picks up. Additionally, he will be aware that I am an official corporate employee if she forwards his call to me. Though not perfect, it's incredibly effective. After I gave him the main switchboard number, he hung up right away. A few minutes later, my phone rang, and I received a call from an operator named Mr. Miller. This will allow us to contact you outside working hours, if that is required, he said, asking for my telephone number next. Now that we've dispensed with the identification process, he added effortlessly after I gave it to him, please tell me how our service may help you. I'm looking for a very special companion who can be available for a series of occasions that may stretch over a month or more. The voice said, Hem, it seems a little strange. It is unusual for us to commit to anything for this long. We might be able to assist you, but it will come at a high cost. He gave me a price that brought tears to my eyes. That will be fine, Mr. Miller, I said. All right, are there any unique needs you have in mind? Yes, I replied, she has to look like a goddess. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, sir, he laughed. However, I believe you'll be able to locate a partner who meets your needs. He stopped, then said, a pen by chance. He then gave me the address for their website after I told him I did. After making your choices, sir, kindly be aware that your password and username will change. This is for both our own and your safety. Now about the matter of payment, sir, once you have made your selection and she is scheduled for a session, your credit card will be charged in the amount that you have just agreed upon. He continued after I nodded that I understood. Furthermore, we expect our clients to express their gratitude to our partners directly. If everything works out well, we suggest leaving a 25% gratuity. I quickly performed some mental calculations and concluded, this had better work, or I'm going to be broke as well as humiliated. Excellent, sir. When you are prepared to choose, kindly visit our website. That's where you may make all additional arrangements. Good day, sir. At that point, the call ended. I had to wait till I got home that evening to visit the website Henry had given me. The username and password Henry had provided got me into the site, and a window that looked as if it had come straight out of a Victoria's Secret catalog identified itself as only Capricorn services with the tagline, catering to the needs of the most discerning clients. I wondered why all the women pictured there weren't in modeling instead of the escort business. In fact, I wondered if the pictures weren't a bait and switch scam, but my friend Jerry had insisted that Capricorn was real, so I decided to take a chance. The women looked so beautiful. I had assumed that I would go with a blonde for this purpose, but I was drawn to a picture of a woman with dark shoulder-length hair, so I impulsively clicked on Rhiannon. The screen confirmed that Rhiannon would get in touch with me to set up a meeting within the next 24 hours, and then I was asked for my credit card information. After my card number and expiration date were validated, the screen went black and I was abruptly removed from the website. Curious, I tried to return to the Capricorn website, but this time the welcome screen refused to accept my username and password, and I was sent back to my home page after trying again. I was pretty impressed with the security their system employed, so I took that as a positive sign. If they went to that much trouble, perhaps their service lived up to Jerry's claims. My little plan was going to be very expensive to implement and there was no guarantee of success, but when I went to the break room to get myself a cup of coffee, two secretaries who had been talking when I walked in immediately fell silent and looked away from me. It didn't take a genius to figure out who was the subject of their conversation. The pain of being the subject of office gossip strengthened my resolve, and I decided that no matter what, I wasn't going to continue as the helpless victim if I could do something about it. My phone didn't ring until after supper, and when I answered, a sweet voice said, Hi, Michael, this is Rhiannon calling. I'm excited to finally meet you. After taking a big breath, I replied, recommending that we get together for supper to talk about my request. She accepted, so I proposed the same grill that Jerry and I had used. It was cozy, dark, and far enough from Eden Point that I wouldn't likely run into any of my neighbors. She chuckled. I don't think I've ever enjoyed dining there before. After saying, I'll look forward to seeing you there, she hung up. Leading us on, I thought. One of the reasons I'd chosen the grill was that it wasn't too busy on a weeknight, and the low lighting worked well for me. However, when she entered the room, it was as if a spotlight shone directly on her, causing me to tensely stand up before she confidently shook my hand and said, Hello, Michael, in that melodic voice. It's a pleasure to meet you in person. I must have been staring at her because, as she sat down, she giggled and remarked, Well, how do I look? The young woman seated opposite me was absolutely stunning. 
the dark eyes, high cheekbones, pouty lips, the way her hair framed her face, her athletic but womanly figure, I could go on and on, but the fact was that for a few moments all I could do was stare at her in silent wonder. They're gorgeous, but they're not real. But now I was meeting one of them in person, and the impact was overwhelming. The stillness was broken with a smile and the statement, I'm going to take that to mean you approve. Oh, yes, I apologize, I stumbled, I just, for a moment, that is, my embarrassed voice trailed off. Luckily, the waitress arrived at that precise moment to take our orders. I can't even recall what I ordered, but Rhiannon ordered a green salad with dressing on the side. I could tell the waitress was smitten with Rhiannon because she kept looking at her until she finally exclaimed, aren't you on television? With a charming smile, Rhiannon said, no, I'm afraid not, and the waitress left, muttering to herself. I looked at Rhiannon inquisitively and said, I'll bet that happens to you often. Their brief exchange allowed the logical side of my brain to re-engage. Unconsciously nodding, she said, yes, that does happen pretty often. I have a question for you. I stammered a little at the end and asked, why aren't you on television or modeling instead of, well, you know. She admitted, I've looked into it, but that's a very competitive environment. Even though I might seem attractive to you, I'm just one person in that world. The chances of succeeding are comparable to those of an NBA basketball player, but I'm unique in my field of work. I also didn't have to go hungry for years in order to pay my dues, unlike in acting or modeling. Right from the beginning, I was earning a lot of money. I'll have saved enough money by the time my appearance starts to fade that I could live off of my investments for the rest of my life. And if I'm extremely fortunate, I'll meet a wealthy man who doesn't give a damn about her previous occupation and just wants a trophy wife. Even though I disagreed with her professional choice, she had taken a sensible approach to it, so I couldn't help but nod. The waitress arrived at that moment, brought our entrees, and after serving Rhiannon, asked, Are you sure you're not on TV? I have a strong feeling that I have seen you before. I don't think so, Rhiannon said, shaking her head. I'm sure I would have remembered it if I had been. A quick departure was made by the waitress as I attempted to suppress my laughing. So, Michael, why don't you give me an idea of what you have in mind? She asked me as we started eating. This is something a little unusual, according to Henry. Rhiannon looked at me sympathetically, that was pretty cold. And when I told her about Frank Calhoun and his behavior, she nodded knowingly, I've met a lot of his type. I blushed and started telling her my story. So what exactly that you want to do, and how do I fit into the picture? She asked, daintily wiping her mouth before folding her palms on the table. After stating my goals for the next month or so for the next 15 minutes, I freely acknowledged that I wasn't sure I was doing the right thing. But I just can't sit by and let the two of them run roughshod over me without fighting back. I said, and now that we've met, I'm starting to believe that this could work. She grinned broadly and said, what a kind comment. She leaned forward across the table and said, you know what? I anticipate enjoying this. Fantastic. To partners in crime, she murmured with a sneaky smile, laughing at my eagerness. To partners in crime, I replied, reaching across to shake her hand to seal the bargain. She then sat up and did something with her body that I wasn't quite able to see. Then she added in a low, sensual voice, as we finished the business part of our meeting, might we move to somewhere cozier for the fun part? I had to take a sip of water to quench my sudden dry tongue before I could continue. No, I replied, tonight is just supposed to be a get acquainted session. She smiled mischievously at me. You don't find me attractive. I slid an envelope across the table to her and said, oh, gosh, no. I mean yes, I mean it's not that. It's just I'm trying to keep focused on what we're planning to do here, and it would be better for me not to get involved with you that way, don't you see? I had previously jammed several thick band notes inside of it. With solemnity, she scooped it up and tucked it inside her purse. Her unclean side appeared to disappear as she shifted her posture once more. She turned her head slightly to face me and said, I think maybe I do understand, Michael. You're a very interesting man. I think I'm going to enjoy our little adventure together. That being said, she got up and departed, leaving me sitting in the booth. For some reason, I was exhausted. I said to myself, that is some woman. Phase I of Operation Honey Trap was supposed to start on set just after lunch. Atlanta was getting hot already, so I assumed there would be a lot of people at the Eden Point pool. I was a little anxious as to whether Rhiannon would arrive, but a BMW Z4 drove into my driveway just after noon. I arched my eyebrows when she appeared at my door with a little bag and stated, my swimwear. She grinned as she glanced around. So this is suburbia. Do you like it here? I grimaced. I did until recently. She gave me a cheek pat. We're going to fix that. At the clubhouse, we split off to get to the locker rooms and change into our suits. I emerged first, as we had planned, and discovered two lounge chairs next to an umbrella-covered table. As soon as I settled in, I noticed that large Frank Calhoun was approaching me. Well, Michael, he said loudly, I'm surprised to see you at the pool today. I would have thought you'd be taking a lesson from the pro, trying to improve your tennis game. Even though I knew he was teasing me, I gave him a fair response. Nope, today my girlfriend and I are going to enjoy the pool and get a little sun. Frank was not going to give up on me so lightly. Oh, you have a girlfriend now. I'd like to meet her. Those nearby had been interested in our discourse by this point. 
I was okay with that. I gestured toward the door leading to the women's locker room and remarked, Well you're in luck, Frank. Here she comes now. Oh my goodness. The club members quieted down when Rhiannon came over to talk to us. She was dressed in a one-piece swimsuit, which surprised me as I had anticipated her to be in a bikini, but it was far more alluring in some way. It commanded the attention of every man and woman in sight because it was composed of some sort of glittering substance that collected and reflected the sun. She was wearing stiletto-heeled slippers when I heard a clicking sound. Her thighs, calves, and entire appearance were transformed to perfection. I forced my gaze from her legs back to her suit as she inched closer to us. I realized that it had to be made of the thinnest material I had ever seen when I noticed that it somehow appeared different. It perfectly fit every curve of her body, and upon closer inspection, I could see that the suit was completely unlined. It appeared as though she had painted it on. She approached me, put her arm around mine, planted a peck on my cheek, and pressed her breasts on my bicep. She went to Frank and said, Oh, good, honey, you've gotten a place for us. Who's your friend, Michael? Looking at Frank, I was amused to see that he was staring at the scene in front of him with his mouth hanging open. Rhiannon, I replied, I'd like you to meet Frank. Frank, this is my girlfriend Rhiannon. His jaw dropped shut, and he hurried to give her a hasty handshake. With a fairly grandiose greeting, welcome to Eden Point. If there's anything I can do to assist you, please don't hesitate to ask. Rhiannon had a charming smile. Oh, how nice, she said, slyly turning to face me. Is everyone here as nice as Frank? She asked. Gritting my teeth, I said, no, Frank is unique. She gave him another smile. Well, thank you so much for making me feel right at home. She grinned as she glanced down at him when he just stood there. You can let go of my hand now. He exclaimed, embarrassed, oh, well, I have to get going. I hope I see more of you, Rhiannon. Um, I mean, I hope I see you around again. He moved away, looking awkwardly over his shoulder as he left, and then turned back to face the other side of the pool. Melanie was sitting there with her arms crossed when I happened to gaze in her direction. She didn't appear content. I reclined in our lounge chairs with Rhiannon. She grabbed my hand and drew me in so she could mutter something in my ear. I thought that went rather well. I gave her a tight squeeze. You were flawless, I told her. She flashed me a brief kiss on the lips, grinning. Fifteen minutes later, I could still feel her lips. I know she intended it in a kind way. She then collapsed onto the lounge chair, face down. I know for sure that every member of my men's team stopped by, and after a few light-hearted words, I made it a point to introduce them to Rhiannon, who was gracious to every one of them, conversing easily as though they were old friends. Over the course of the next couple of hours, I believe everyone who was at the pool that day made it a point to stroll by us to get a glimpse of my new girlfriend. I winked and smiled at her, saying, in my line of work, I'm only one step away, as I bent over and whispered in her ear, you should have gone into politics. I guffawed. She leaned back toward me as things calmed down. Which one is she? I recognized Melanie immediately and gestured for her to come over to the other side of the pool. All right, she said, let me handle this. She clipped over to Melanie's side of the pool, pulled on her high-heeled mules, bent over with her waist facing the water, took off her shoes, and dove gracefully into the shallow end. When she came to, she bowed her head forward, then quickly flipped it back so that her hair formed a graceful arc over her head, shooting water into the air in the shape of a fan. I was astounded. I had seen that move in commercials before, but never in real life. Then Rhiannon pushed herself out of the water and onto the deck with such grace that it took a moment to realize how much the water was covering her body as she stood facing Melanie and pushed her hair back, highlighting her body in the process, then slipped the mules back on her feet, gaining four inches in height, and walked back to where I was staring. Reluctantly, I switched my gaze from Rhiannon to Melanie, who was glaring angrily at me. She turned and gave Frank a severe look before gathering her belongings and making her way out of the room, with him following closely behind and once more peering over his shoulder at Rhiannon. She closed her eyes and sat down elegantly on the lounge chair. I could just make out her mumble, mission accomplished. While we were packing things to depart, I noticed Penny come toward me. Oh, hell, I thought to myself, I forgot all about Penny's women's team playing today. That was the only unfortunate thing that happened while we were there. What information will I give her? Hello Michael, it's great to see you around once more. We could get together and play some more, perhaps. She came to a sudden stop as Rhiannon got up and grabbed my arm. Oh, Penny exclaimed, startled, who's this? Well, this is my date, Rhiannon, I stumbled to say. Penny blinked and took a silent minute to stare at Rhiannon. She then extended her hand. Her name was Penny. Before I could come up with anything to say, she turned and scurried away. It's nice to meet you, she said, turning back to face me. Um, I've got to get cleaned up. I'm pretty grimy after our match today. See you around, Michael. Rhiannon inquired, who was that? With curiosity, that was Penny Pennington, I informed her. She's my partner for mixed doubles. Interesting, was her reply. I gave myself a mental kick for not having thought out how I was going to handle Penny beforehand. I didn't want to give away my strategy, but I also didn't want Penny to think the incorrect thing. Oh no. Not long afterward, Rhiannon and I made the decision to end the day. I thought we had completed all of our goals for the day. 
I think I heard the volume of conversation increase as we left the pool area. Upon returning home, I let Rhiannon use my shower while I showered and contemplated the afternoon. Everything had gone even better than I could have imagined, save for my chance meeting with Penny. I made it clear to Melanie that I would not spend the rest of my life moping over her abandonment. Furthermore, I demonstrated to her that not only was she interchangeable, but I had actually advanced very far. Let her mull over that for a bit, I thought to myself in victory. A voice asked, so how do you think it went? From behind me, I turned to find Rhiannon standing there with a bath towel wrapped around her. I exclaimed, you were perfect. With enthusiasm, you were everything I'd hoped for and more. I stood there for a second not knowing how to breathe. She had the most flawless appearance. Realizing I'd been holding my breath, I gasped. Bracing myself, I approached her, knelt, and gave her the towel that she had dropped. I'm sorry, Rhiannon. It's just not the right time. She grinned. She patted away from me, draping the towel over her shoulder and saying, Okay, I was just checking. I had never seen her back before, oh my. She had dressed and packed her luggage when she returned. I gave the sealed envelope to her. I said, thank you, very much. Today was exactly what I wanted. Would you like to reunite with Melanie? She inquired abruptly. I winced. No, that wasn't a one-time mistake in judgment or a lack of control, I angrily declared. She purposefully threw me out of the way, treating me like a piece of garbage she had outgrown. No matter what, I would never have her back. I just wondered, she responded, but that's what I thought. Anyhow, will we continue to meet next week? Oh, definitely, I grinned broadly. I wanted everyone to know that I was coming out of hiding, so I made it a point to attend tennis practice at the club during the week. Glad you're back and have come out swinging, our team captain told me. My teammates greeted me with slaps on the back and broad winks. I heard someone say behind my back, lucky sob. Knowing the kind of impression Rhiannon might leave, I grinned. When I returned to the courts a few days later for mixed doubles practice, our captain informed me that Penny had phoned in sick, so I immediately contacted her when I got home from practice. Are you okay, Penny? It's not like you to be sick, I inquired. Oh, it's nothing serious, probably just a little bug going around. What can I buy for you? Please allow me to bring it over to you, I inquired. No, nah, thanks, but I don't really need anything, she remarked firmly. In any case, it would be preferable if you avoided it. Anything I have, I don't want you to get. Well, sure, I nervously replied, but please give me a call as soon as you start feeling ill. I'm worried for you. Henny was always so healthy and vital that it disturbed me to think anything might be wrong with her. And our little run-in at the pool last said it probably didn't help any, I thought. I still felt like I couldn't tell her about my honey trap for fear of screwing things up, but I just hated to have Penny get the wrong impression. Hopefully she'll forgive me after it's all over, I thought. She gave me a vague promise and then said she needed to rest, so I let her go. That weekend was the next phase in my plan. Rhiannon and I were going to attend the club's potluck supper, and she had dressed considerably differently from our last adventure when she showed up at my house. You really do appear as though you just stepped out of a fashion magazine. I remarked, gazing at her. Her attire, which consisted of a blouse, casual jacket, and skirt of some sort, may have seemed unremarkable, but the materials, cuts, and finishing touches all shouted high fashion. With a little girl's curtsy, she said, Thank you, kind sir. Indeed, these were recently added to Nordstrom, she said, adding, But don't worry if you don't recognize the labels. My main objective for tonight is to hit on women, namely one specific lady. Well, I can't speak for the wives, but I think you're still going to have quite an impact on the men, I said with sincerity. Rhiannon turned to face me as we arrived into the clubhouse parking lot and said, We need to adjust our strategy a little bit tonight. We should divide up and socialize with these people. That will enable me to complete my tasks. It seems reasonable to me, I said. As soon as we entered the patio area where the supper was being held, I knew that we'd both been correct. The wives were a little more subdued, but I heard more than one remark about Rhiannon's attire that night. A few of the more outspoken women even made it a point to ask her where she'd found her clothes, and before long, Rhiannon was happily trading shopping advice with them. She and I regrouped for dinner after some socializing. Any luck? Quietly, I asked her. Oh, I've been a very busy girl, she remarked gravely. I've discovered a great deal about the wives' perceptions of the circumstances surrounding you, Melanie, and Frank. More significantly, I have been causing your ex much distress. Her fiancé didn't appreciate the fact that I've been flirting with her quite a bit. Rhiannon obviously knew precisely which buttons to push, and I just smiled. Melanie gestured to me as she passed, and I followed her curiously to find out what she wanted. When she turned to face me, her face was flushed with rage, and she said, Well, it looks like you've wasted no time getting back into the dating game, with a sour tone. I remarked mockingly, I didn't realize there was a mandatory waiting period. Yes, Michael, it appears like you are totally out of your league with that one. How in the world did you locate her? When we were married, I never got to meet her. I got to know her at work, I remarked inanely. Well, if I were you, I'd be careful. She appears to be much more than you can manage. The thought crossed my mind, you're wrong about that, Melanie, I handle her every chance I get. Is that accurate? 
You'd better keep her away from Frank, she uttered angrily. After saying that, she bounded off. Everything was going precisely as I had intended, so I grinned to myself. Annie was on the entertainment committee, but I wasn't sure if she would be well enough to come tonight until I spotted her carrying a tray of food. I hurried over and grabbed her arm, and she flushed when she saw me. I'm so glad you're feeling better, I said to her. You should have called me to let me know you felt well enough to come tonight. I suppose, Michael, I didn't know till the very last minute. Besides, I didn't want to bother you because I assumed you would be here with your new girlfriend. Then he said, frowning, and I see that I was right, as Rhiannon passed by, laughing and chatting with one of my teammates. I caught hold of her arm once more as she turned to leave, saying, Wait, Penny, we need to talk about our next match. Following a period of apparent hesitation, she said, About that, Michael, things have gotten really busy for me lately, and, well, I've decided to drop mixed doubles and just focus on the women's team. You can't do that, Penny, I blurted out, shocked. You're my partner. With whom shall I play, I wonder. I turned to see Rhiannon standing there as Penny peered over my shoulder. You'll find somebody, Michael, Penny murmured. Now, please let me go. I have to get this food out, she said, darting out as soon as I released her arm. Taking my hand, Rhiannon led the way to an empty table, where she leaned over and said, Just so you know, that girl is in love with you. What? No, that's absurd, she's my partner in tennis. She was taking a Pilates class with Melanie. Rhiannon continued, obliging me, and if my memory serves me correctly, you might just be a little in love with her, too. No, I argued. That's a really off-base statement. She's merely a wonderful buddy. Maybe, she replied with doubt. In any case, I think we've done all we can for tonight, so let's get out of here. After we arrived back at my house, I asked Rhiannon, who gave me a smug little smile, to tell me what had happened with Melanie and Frank. I strolled over to where they had their meal put out and tasted it, commenting positively. Melanie was plainly not grateful for my presence, but she was at a loss for words. She was compelled to repay the favor when I told her how much I appreciated her attire. I used it as an opportunity to tell her where I got it. She was obviously familiar with the ensemble and knew its estimated cost. Though she remained silent, her eyes were nearly green with jealousy. That sounds like Melanie, I replied. She's definitely into fashion and prides herself on her taste in clothing. Just then, Rhiannon went on. One of the other women asked Melanie to help out in the kitchen. She was forced to leave me by myself with Frank even though she didn't want to. I reached over and took another taste of their food after she had left. Rhiannon acted out what she had done as she spoke. Clearly realizing the impression she'd made, she straightened up and smiled at me. Once I got Frank's attention, I started to flirt with him seriously. He had an opportunity to brag a little when I asked him if he had ever played football. I leaned over and gave him a chest rub while he was doing that. She laughed. I told him I liked big men and I commented on how much bigger he is than you. I thought he was going to come right there at the table. Well, I uttered, it makes sense why Melanie was acting hostily. I try my best, she stated in a glaringly falsely modest manner. And I can't believe that Frank would believe you were coming on to him, I said. Guys like Frank are so self-centered that it would never occur to them to doubt a woman's interest, she said with a mocking laugh. The irony lies in the fact that they typically make the worst lovers. That made me smile. If Rhiannon was right, that would definitely serve Melanie's interests. I gave her her envelope and asked, Are we prepared for the next step, in your opinion? I questioned her. Without a doubt, the dance at your club will be ideal for our plans, she said, turning to move toward the front entrance. What? Not a single seduction attempt this evening. With a smile, I asked her. Over her shoulder, she smiled back at me, saying, I wouldn't think of it. Then, she turned and gave me a small jolt through my loins. After she left, I cracked open a can of beer and took a seat to consider what was going on. On the one hand, I was relieved that the honey trap was working, knowing that Melanie was unhappy that I had found someone to replace her so quickly and even more uncomfortable that this new person was much hotter than Melanie would ever be. Even though all of that was extremely satisfying, I couldn't help but be depressed about Penny's circumstances. Could Rhiannon have been correct? Could I actually be feeling something for Penny? I questioned. Since Melanie had first introduced us, I had also found her attractive, slim, athletic, graceful, and with an extroverted personality, but I had also always been cautious to limit our relationship to that of friends and tennis partners because I knew that was how Penny wanted it, too, particularly as she was grieving the loss of her husband. I pondered on Rhiannon's remarks regarding Penny. That is not possible to be true, is it? Why was Penny avoiding me like the plague if she was interested in me? And why was I so bothered by that? Why, in addition, had I rejected down the sexiest woman I will probably ever meet on multiple occasions? Could it have anything to do with my feelings for Penny? I gave up and went to bed at last. My inquiries were unanswered, and even if they had, I would not have known how to proceed. I concluded that staying the course and maintaining my attention on the plan I had put in place was the best course of action for me. The club's yearly spring dance was a big hit, with a sizable attendance each year. The guys reluctantly wore their sports coats, and some even wore ties, while the women dressed up for the dance. I was hoping that Frank and Marlene would show up. 
I had informed Rhiannon about our plans, and I was interested in seeing her outfit for the night's finale. So when I saw her get out of her car wearing jeans and a t-shirt, I was taken aback and disappointed. They were, admittedly, the tightest jeans I had ever seen on a female. She said, you didn't think I was going to risk my dress driving over here, did you? Just let me use your bedroom for a little while and then I'll be ready to go. I guess my face gave me away because she stroked it as she passed me. Since I had already put on my jeans and sports coat, I eagerly paced the den as she dressed. I laughed to myself, damn, it feels like we're a married couple. She spoke to me after a short while, saying, Michael, can you come in here? I need your help with something. I turned to face the bedroom door and opened it. Dear God, oh dear. Rhiannon was in that position. She took a half step in her high heels and spun around to show that her underwear was actually a thong that showed off her whole rear cheeks. She smiled a little and turned back to face me, asking, Will I do? I stepped in her direction out of self-control. But she smiled and held up a hand to stop me. No, no, not now. I can't afford to have you mess this up. So now that I have your approval, get out of here and let me put my dress on. I believe I stumbled as I made my way back to the den. She reappeared after a short while. This time, she was dressed in an off-white, strapless gown similar to the I forcefully gulped. When I told her, I think you may cause some heart attacks tonight, I wasn't joking. All she did was grin and hold out her arm for me to lead her out the door. The club had cleaned its patio area and placed paper lights overhead for the dance. Even though it was corny, I couldn't help but like the way the tinkling music and soft light combined. I was not shocked to discover that Rhiannon was a far better dancer than I was when she slipped into my arms to dance. She put her head on my shoulder as we danced together, and that's when I realized I didn't mind that she was a working girl. I simply relished her companionship and the sensation of her body against mine. Taking a step back to face me, she lifted her head and said, You know, this suburban living isn't so bad. A girl could get used to it. Her back tensed before I could say anything. Uh oh, battle stations. I turned just in time to see Frank Calhoun coming our way with Melanie clearly not feeling very enthusiastic about it. He bellowed, Hello, Michael, hello, Rhiannon. So glad you decided to join us this evening. How about switching partners for a dance or two? He whirled Rhiannon away as I exceeded, leaving Melanie and myself standing there looking quite uncomfortable. I extended my arms toward her. Care for a dance, for old time's sake. Reluctantly, she consented, and I started dancing with her as a new song commenced. I had been married to this woman for eleven years and had loved her, so it was a unique experience. However, following the events, all that remained within me was a strong desire to make her experience the consequences of what she had done to me. So was our marriage really that bad? I inquired. She let out a sigh. No, Michael, it wasn't like that at all. We had some good years and some good times. But then things settled down into a routine, and after a while I just didn't feel very excited about our relationship anymore. When Frank came along and made it so obvious how much he wanted me, I just got swept up in it all. I really fell hard, Michael. It felt just like when I was back in college. She was staring at me. I didn't want to hurt you, Michael, but I had to do what was right for me. Can you understand that? I remarked sourly, I get that you choose to trade up. I didn't mean it that way, she retorted. That's okay, I replied, I've traded up too. With a wince, she realized who I was seeing now, and I felt a little satisfied. That was only going to get better if everything went according to plan later. When I looked up, Rhiannon and Frank were strolling toward us, holding hands. Your date is back, Michael, Frank remarked, smirking a little. Melanie was having trouble catching up as he left, saying, have a nice night. I started dancing with Rhiannon again. I asked her in a whisper, how did it go? Her smile was so evident in her voice. The bait is firmly set, she declared. He's convinced that I've got the hots for him. He's going to make some excuse to Melanie and we're going to meet back at the clubhouse after everyone has left. I'm just a little nervous about that part. The timing is going to have to be perfect, I said to her. She licked my ear and I trembled helplessly. You just leave that to me. Women know all about such things. I soon saw that the number of individuals was starting to decline as the night wore on. Rhiannon noticed me, so I suppose I was glancing about. Sorry, Michael, she said. I don't think Penny came tonight. I asked her, am I that transparent? Like glass, she remarked, smirking a little. Once we arrived back at my place, I took another envelope out of my pocket and gave it to Rhiannon. I may not get a chance to give you this later, she responded, and I wanted to make sure you got it okay. I believed she accepted it almost unwillingly. After giving me a brief glance, her expression altered. Somehow, the goddess vanished, leaving behind a real woman who was still quite lovely. This has been the most unusual assignment I've ever had, she stated, and you're unlike any client I've ever had. It's been a little frustrating at times, I was blushing, but I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I grasped her hands both in mine. When I set out to get revenge, I knew I needed someone with remarkable attributes, I responded. But I never expected I would find someone like you, and I'll never forget you. Abruptly, I moved forward and gave her a kiss on the lips. She held it for a few seconds before taking a sharp step back. She made several quick eye blinks before hurriedly saying, mustn't mess up my lipstick. 
After that, she looked down at her wristwatch, which was covered in jewels, and said, It's almost time, we need to get going. Give me exactly thirty minutes. With that, she left the house, got into her car, and drove off. After standing there for a minute, I decided what to do. I had to take that risk even though Rhiannon and I hadn't discussed it. I prayed I didn't mess everything up. I took out my mobile phone. I guess she knew my phone number. Michael, why are you calling at this hour? Penny, I'm about to ask you the biggest favor of my life. Please, please, don't ask any questions. Just meet me at the clubhouse in 30 minutes. What's going on, Michael? What's this all about? Please, Penny, I pleaded, I don't have time to explain. Please trust me. Just come in 30 minutes. I'm sorry, I have to go now. I disconnected the phone. I walked toward the clubhouse, wondering if she would arrive. Though it was unlikely, I reasoned that it was my only opportunity. There were two automobiles parked in the lot when I arrived. I took out my phone once more and placed a new call. Frank. Melanie yelled over the phone, Where are you? It's not Frank, I responded, it's Michael. Michael, what do you want, and why are you calling so late? She asked. I'm calling because I know where Frank is. He's with Rhiannon. What? exclaimed she. Where are they? I hung up after saying, Listen, just meet me at the clubhouse as fast as you can. Frank's residence was a few blocks away from the clubhouse, yet, it seemed she rushed, as I quickly caught sight of her dashing through a backyard. She didn't make it to the clubhouse before I caught up to her. She angrily asked, Where is he? I grabbed her wrist and said, Quiet. You've got to be quiet so we can catch them. I showed her the unlocked entrance to the clubhouse and we crossed the threshold on tiptoes. We heard whispers and the rustle of clothes as we entered the lounge. Melanie's eyes widened, visible through the filtered faint light coming in through the windows. I quickly covered her lips with my palm to silence her, and then I gestured to the wall-mounted light switch. We stepped over to it as she nodded in understanding. The moment I turned on the light switch, the room filled with light. Frank yelled in shock and tried to get up, tripping over his own clothes and falling on the ground. Once more, he stumbled to his feet and hastily pulled his pants up. Rhiannon sprung from where she'd been resting on the couch behind him. Melanie started yelling at Frank, and I had to stop her. You dirty guy, how could you do this to me? We're supposed to get married. Fearing Melanie's fury, Rhiannon cowered behind Frank, clinging to his arm. Frank was back to his confident self now that he was dressed. What do you want to do now, baby? He said Rhiannon after giving me a brazen glance. She said, oh, Frank, in a childlike voice, I just want to be with you. He put his arm around her in a protective manner as she clung to him. Then he faced us one more. His first words, to Melanie's dismay, were directed towards me. Well, Michael, it looks like you've lost another woman. Melanie screamed, but I remained silent. What about us, Frank? What about us? The large man looked at her. Listen, Melanie, we had a good thing for a while, but it would never have lasted. Now I've found someone better and I'm going to be devoting all my time to her. He turned to face Melanie after giving Rhiannon one more look. You can't blame a guy for wanting to trade up, can you? Melanie heard those comments and, even in her pain and rage, she couldn't help but cast a guilt-ridden glare at me. Rhiannon pivoted and skillfully put on her dress. She turned around again and encircled Frank's neck with her arms. He leaned forward to give her a kiss. His words, come on, baby, let's get out of here, as he pulled her in the direction of the door. Frank, feel free to proceed. I have some important matters to discuss with Michael. In addition, I would prefer not to abandon my car here. See you at the bar. She fumbled in her handbag for a piece of paper and quickly jotted down an address. Honey, I'll be right behind you. With a skeptical gaze, he asked, are you sure you're going to be okay? He inquired. Yes, honey, I'm sure. Michael isn't the kind of guy who would hurt me. Frank laughed and said, yeah, I guess you're right. He then left through the door, and we heard him get into his car. Melanie yelled, you trash. When she escaped my hands while we were focusing on Frank, and lunged for Rhiannon, her claws outstretched. Rather than recoiling, Rhiannon composedly maintained her position. Listen, Melanie, there are a few things you need to know, Rhiannon replied, gesturing for her to stop fighting. I could care less about your Neanderthal ex fiance and I have absolutely no intention of joining him at the bar where he's headed. Melanie looked shocked and said, but, but why? Why did I seduce him? Because that's my profession, I'm a paid escort. I've been with dozens of guys like Frank. They all think they're God's gift to women, and they're always on the lookout for the next piece of meat. Do you think he loved you? The only thing he really loved was the chance to finally beat Michael at something. I'm sure he loved screwing you, but he loved screwing Michael over even more. So Michael hired me to get a little payback from Frank, and at the same time to show you how it feels when a lover is unfaithful. It hurts, doesn't it? After letting out a scream, Melanie lunged towards me. But before I could respond, Melanie was shouldered off her feet by a man who suddenly appeared in front of me. She fell clumsily to the ground. Henny clenched her hands and stood over her. Melanie just lay there and started to cry. You deserve that, Melanie. After what you did to Michael, you deserve a lot more. I got the impression that her emotional pain outweighed any physical pain. When Penny turned to face me, I could see that she was crying. Is that really true? She inquired. Is she really not your girlfriend? 
No, I replied firmly, she was my partner in the honey trap we set for Frank and Melanie, but nothing more. But Penny, she's so pretty, she objected. I could never compete with someone like her. Rhiannon approached Penny and rested her hands on her shoulders. You silly girl, I was the one who never had a chance. He only had eyes for you. Penny turned to face me once more. You mean you never even. Once more, Rhiannon stepped in. No, Penny, he never did. I could never get his mind off you long enough to get his hands on me. And believe me, I gave him the opportunity. Though she didn't say anything, Penny gave me a radiant gaze. Rhiannon smiled at the two of us. I think it's time I got out of here. I've had harder assignments than this, but somehow this one has worn me out. Melanie got herself up from the floor at that very time. What about me? Where do I go? I can't go back to Frank's house, not after what's happened. Penny gave her a contemplative glance. She gave me a loud kiss and said, I don't know what you're going to do tomorrow, but you can sleep at my house tonight. I'm going to go home with Michael. I chose to hold on to her hand and not let go. But I couldn't shake it, so I turned back to Rhiannon. What about Frank? Where did you send him anyway? She chuckled. That was the address of a gay bar I know. I wonder how long he'll stay there before he realizes I'm not coming. Her smile vanished from her face and she gave me a serious expression. She leaned over and kissed me tenderly, saying, Good luck, Michael. You're a special man, and I won't forget you. Penny's grasp tightened on my hand. Then Rhiannon turned to look at Penny, an angry expression appearing on her face. You treat him right, you understand me. If I ever hear you haven't, I'll come back, and this time I won't take no for an answer. She lost the furious expression on her face and I saw later that it was sadness. She reached over to give me a cheek pat. But I don't think I'm going to get that lucky. Subsequently, she reached inside her purse and placed an item inside my hand. She turned and walked out the door after saying, goodbye, her hips swiveling gloriously. I turned to face my hand. Four unopened envelopes were inside. My comment, totally understand OP's desire for revenge. I am not sure how he could manage to stay in close proximity to his ex and her boyfriend. You agree? Comment down below, sub and bell and I will catch you in the next one.